60 Minutes Rewind. Bashar al-Assad destroyed Syria in order to remain its president. The dictator, son of a dictator, has committed every war crime on the books, bombing civilians, gassing neighborhoods, torturing prisoners. An estimated 400,000 people have been killed in the civil war and 11 million forced from their homes. Last December, with his allies Russia and Iran, Assad occupied the ruins of Aleppo, Syria's largest city. Various rebel groups continue to fight, and Assad means to break them with another war crime, the destruction of hospitals. What you're about to see is difficult to watch, but it's worth it, because standing in Assad's way are courageous doctors, many of them American volunteers, risking their lives to heal the wounds of war. This is a hospital during the siege of Aleppo. From the looks of it, maybe an exhausted father, a distraught mother, and a child at left curled up on a gurney. That was an airstrike. This hospital was hit 14 times in six months. This is Aleppo again, last year. <laughs> Al Jazeera reporter Amro Halabi was covering the aftermath of a chemical attack. Once the ER filled up, the hospital was hit. The nursery was evacuated. <laughs> then the camera found the neonatal ICU. Targeting hospitals is the atrocity that started the Geneva Conventions 153 years ago and led to the creation of the Red Cross. It is the original war crime. Since 2011, there have been more than 450 attacks on Syrian hospitals. Emergency medicine has been driven underground. Every neighborhood airstrike delivers too many patients with too little time. Doctors improvise with scavenged drugs and salvaged equipment. So many doctors have been killed or have fled that veterinarians and dentists are pressed to do surgery. You work with the understanding that you might find yourself dead or, or crippled or dismembered on the floor next to the people you're trying to save. Dr. Samer Attar is a leading orthopedic surgeon from Chicago who volunteers in Syria's makeshift hospitals. The bombs would land so close, they'd, they'd knock you off your feet, and at times they would directly hit the hospital. But uh, all I did was look around and, and, and follow everyone else's lead because they're like, they're like rocks. They don't lose their cool, they don't lose their composure, they just, they just keep working. Dr. Attar enlisted in the Syrian American Medical Society. It's so far, it's normal. Which began in the 1990s as a professional association. But since the revolution, these American doctors have raised nearly $100 million in aid and sent more than 100 members into rebel held Syria, including Aleppo, where Dr. Attar worked. We'd find ourselves doing surgeries, sometimes without anesthesia, and people lying on gurneys uh, in the hallway because you're just so overstretched. Say hi, everybody. These are Dr. Attar's pictures of Aleppo. I remember another child that was brought in. She couldn't have been more than five. Um, her whole body was pockmarked with shrapnel from her chest to her belly. And one of the surgeons in Aleppo, a Syrian surgeon, heroically rushed her to the operating room and and opened up her belly and stopped the bleeding in her liver. But she had lost so much blood, we, we can't, you can't give all of your blood to save one life if you can save it to give a little bit each to five who you know will make it. And I saw that all the time. Did that little girl make it? That girl, no, she did not. 
seeing little bodies wrapped in white shrouds with the cloth still bleeding, because the bodies still bleed, they'd be wrapped in white shrouds and just placed outside to be taken to be buried. Six-year-old Mohammed Kamet was destined for a burial shroud until a Syrian surgeon saved his life. Mohammed's house had been hit by a mortar, and he became unforgettable to Samaritar. And I remember him because um, he lost his mother and um, his siblings and uh, both of his legs. The day before I left Aleppo, he asked me to bring back robotic legs, prosthetic legs, if I ever returned. Um, and if only were that, that simple, he thought that I could deliver them like a pair of gym shoes and that everything would be back to normal. He'd go back to running around and, and playing soccer. It's the worst humanitarian crisis in our lifetimes and because those are our own people. Basil Termanini is vice president of the Syrian American Medical Society. He's a gastroenterologist in Steubenville, Ohio. He told us the society donated 120 ambulances, pays the salaries of nearly 2,000 Syrian staff, equips 135 medical facilities, and is building more. There have been more than 500 attacks on healthcare facilities, and we had more than 800 casualties from the staff. Uh, so we're trying to move all those facilities underground. Did you say 800 medical professionals have been killed in attacks on hospitals? Yes, more than 800. I think now it's the latest, it's 850. Uh, there are attacks on hospitals. There are people are detained, tortured to death. Um, there are shelling also, mostly airstrikes and barrel bombs. This is the number one uh, killer for the health staff. Who are some of the men and women who work with you inside Syria? Those are our heroes. They know they're risking their lives every day, risking their family's life, but they know if they migrate and go out, nobody is willing to provide those services. So then we try to support them. Whatever they need, we try to fulfill. What they need is to know that they are not alone. How many trips in does this make for you? This is number four. We traveled into Syria with Dr. Attar. The road to Aleppo was in the hands of an Islamist rebel group known as Harar al-Sham. Our route was through Idlib, the last whole province still at war. We found a hospital hit by an airstrike, but somehow still running. On the darkened but functioning side of the hospital, How are you? Okay. Samaritar spotted Abdurham Ghanem, they had worked in Aleppo before its fall last December. It was a massacre, yes. A massacre. So much bodies, so much injuries. We did our best. Which is all you can do. Yes. It wasn't enough, but uh, what we could do. Aleppo's underground hospitals were hard to destroy, so Assad tried to root them out by doubling down on his war crimes. We found two witnesses to this, Dr. Farida, who performs cesareans on wounded women, and her husband, Dr. Abdul Halak, an eye surgeon. They couldn't destroy this building, so they used a chemical weapon uh, in the last two days of the siege. We noticed uh, the smell of chlorine, and uh, we rushed all of the staff, all the patient, to the inner room in that uh, basement. And during this uh, time, many uh, children came to our hospital, and uh, we had just uh, one remaining bottle of oxygen. Uh, so we had to uh, transfer the mask between the children, one uh, small amount of oxygen for each other. <laughs> No one died in the chlorine attack, but the gas shut down the hospital for a time. Now, more sophisticated underground hospitals are being built by the Syrian American Medical Society. In the countryside, they're excavating a cave to replace a regional hospital that serves more than 200,000 people. The operating rooms are where? The main two. These two? Yeah. The cave was already here. The limestone had eroded away over thousands of years. Then the engineers came in, they cleared out the cave, and they lowered this floor about six feet. 
When the hospital's finished, it will have three operating rooms, 12 inpatient beds, and a state-of-the-art emergency room. The story will continue after this. This is much bigger than the basement I worked in in Aleppo. The Syrian American Medical Society has spent more than three and a half million dollars on cave hospitals. The monies come from private donations and the United Nations. Fragments of the bomb. Bomb fragments, the little white spots. For every life saved, he's going to need several more surgeries. There is a lifetime of recovery. So the Syrian American Medical Society supports this hospital on the Syrian border inside Turkey. It is a safe place for long-term healing. A lot of these patients had very severe injuries, such as, you know, severe, very extensive burns. Tamer Ghanem is a surgeon from Detroit who re-sculpts the disfigure. He volunteers when he can get away about a week at a time. One of the most important things is the face, is how people identify themselves. But there are also functional aspects uh, to that, uh, things like being able to open your mouth so you can get a spoon inside your mouth so you can feed yourself. What can you do for these people? It's very rare that one surgery would fix everything. Some of the surgeries I cannot do here just because of limitation of the equipment. I mean, some of these injuries are so horrific that really you're not able to rebuild uh, uh, face back again with, with the tissues that that patient has. It must be frustrating for you to see these patients in so desperate a need and you not being able to help them. Yes, it's very hard. Absolutely. Especially the children. Mm -hmm. Especially I have my own children and it's very difficult to see children, uh, you know, with those injuries and their parents and how that affects them. <laughs> One of those injured children in the Turkish hospital was Mohammed Kement, the same boy from Aleppo who asked American doctor Samir Attar for those robotic legs three years ago. This was the first time they had seen each other since then. Mohammed's prosthetics were supplied by a New Hampshire-based charity called New Day Syria. We asked Mohammed what he wants to be, but we could have guessed. He wants to be an orthopedic surgeon. I'll bet you'd be a very good doctor. Thank you. You understand patients really well. Thank you. The Syrian American Medical Society says that over six years of war, it has delivered 100,000 babies and supported almost 400,000 surgeries. What's his name? Shosmek. No. Why risk your life for this? Well, the Syrian nurses and the doctors, the, the rescue workers that I met um, told me that they would rather risk their lives dying in Syria, trying to save lives, than, than grow old comfortably from a distance, watching the world fall apart. Okay. He's going to be okay. Inshallah, that way. And, um, I thought 20 years from now, I, I didn't want to look back and say that uh, I wasn't a part of that. The war against the hospitals is designed to break the will of the rebellion. But as long as some will fight for mercy, there is reason for all to hope.